All right, hey guys, what's going on? So today we're going to be talking about the complex scalar field, right? So we've talked about the real scalar field, we've quantized it, and we looked at how quantizing it led us down this rabbit hole of seeing that the Hamiltonian gave us a zero-point energy and so forth, okay? These are the weird consequences that are going to come from quantizing our fields, we're going to talk about what the weird effect is when we now when we now quantize a complex scalar field and really the only difference here is we're considering complex numbers instead of real numbers okay again if you like this kind of content please hit that subscribe button like this video and let's get right into it so we're talking about complex scalar fields okay a complex scalar field again is a uh, where it's a scalar field Right? But this time, we're adding complex numbers to this. And one of the ways to add complex numbers is to consider the complex conjugate. What is the complex conjugate? Well, say you have a number, um, say, a complex number 1 plus 2i. Okay, the complex conjugate of that is 1 minus 2i. So everywhere you see an i, you just make it a negative. Okay, you can do the same thing with functions. A, a complex conjugate of some function f of x is just going to be anywhere where it's just going to be that function, the same function, but just uh, anywhere you see a uh, an i in that function, then you just flip the sign. Okay, and so this that's what complex conjugating does. Now let's see what this means for our fields, or our solutions. So let's recall that the real solution to our Klein-Gordon equation, remember the Klein-Gordon equation describes scalar fields, the solution to that looked like this, right? And we took some time in sort of parsing this out, understanding exactly what it meant. It's an oscillating field, it has a conjugate momentum, and so forth, okay? And these are fundamentally operators that exist everywhere in space. Okay, now let's complexify this solution. And the way we do that is by introducing this new notation. So this new notation is, as we see right here, this dagger. Okay, now you've probably seen this in quantum mechanics, where the dagger signifies a... Um, to the complex conjugate of whatever you're looking at, right? So if you have a, a function, this is the complex conjugate, essentially, of the solution, okay? What do I have written here? I have the complex solutions are similar, but we now need two more creation and annihilation operators, right? So where's that? Well, so here, we only have two, right? We had a creation and annihilation operator. But since we're making things complex, we need another set of creation and annihilation operators to make our complex field, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, the complex version of our creation and annihilation operators are what's going to be put into the complex solution, right? The complex goes with complex, real goes with real sort of thing, okay? And this is what we, this is what they're going to look like, right? So... Here, same thing here, but then we have this B dagger, okay? And same thing here, so we have the, this guy here is now down here, and we have the B without this dagger, okay? What does the, why are we doing this? Why isn't this A dagger up here, and why isn't this B dagger down here? Well, the reason is because all of a sudden, when we consider this comp these complex scalar fields, we can think of one of the fields as creating particles. One of these operators is creating particles. The other one we can think of as annihilating particles. Right? So in the real solution, the operator created and annihilated particles, depending on the state you're acting on. Okay? In the complex solution, we automatically parse this out, right? And we say, 
one solution will create particles and the other solution will annihilate particles, okay? But because we have complex solutions and because these solutions fit with the Klein-Gordon equation, there's no reason for us to think that these things aren't, these fields, these complex fields also don't ex also exist. There's no reason for us to think that they don't exist, right? That's philosophical in nature, that um, the, the, the sort of reasoning behind that. Uh, there's no, since there's no reason for us to think that these don't exist, then what we end up with is a field that creates and a field that annihilates. Instead of one field that creates and annihilates, we've parsed things out and we are saying that one field creates one field annihilates. Now, here's the thing. Since we have these complex versions, the next quote that these complex things, so the question becomes well, what physically do those, do these com does introducing these complex things uh, correspond to in the real world? That's what we're interested in physics. And the hypothesis is, or the idea is, that the complex. So the, when we introduce complexity, we're introducing antiparticles, right? Antiparticles are these thing are particles, but they have negative mass, okay? And we'll go into that later, but look, right now we're just sort of getting into the mathematics. We're sort of understanding what exactly the hard line mathematics is before we get into more of the physics, okay? This is physics, right? This is so... This is quantum field theory, but also quantum field theory is heavy in math and we want to take this slow. We want to really understand what the math is like. So, okay, so we have this operator, we have this operator, this, this, so these two operators are embedded in here, right? This overall operator, this guy here, can be thought of as annihilating a particle, right? We don't have a dagger here, so we're going to say that this thing is annihilating a particle. Or another way of saying that is creating an antiparticle. Right? So this thing creates the antiparticle, and this thing annihilates a particle. It's a weird way of thinking about things, but semantically, creating a particle or annihilating a particle is the same thing as creating an antiparticle and vice versa. Creating a particle is the same thing as annihilating an antiparticle, right? Annihilating, this is double negative, right? Uh, double negative is positive. So you're creating a part, you're creating a particle, right? So the, so essentially what is going on is we've part, again, we've parsed this out. We parsed this guy out into a, uh, something that creates and something that annihilates. This thing created and annihilated. These two guys um, create and uh, this guy creates and this guy annihilates. Okay. So associated with these two with these two things, we can create a conjugate momentum, right? We go through all the mathematics. You could pause the video if you want. And, uh, this is pretty self-explanatory, uh, I think. But once you get so you plug the Lagrangian in, Lagrangian all of a sudden has these complex solutions if you take the derivative with respect to the non-complex well that's just a constant right here right and that's so that's going to get us here these are all constants also because we're just looking at the temporal change and we get this so similarly the complex conjugate of uh of our of our thing of our system is going to look like this Okay, and you can go through the math there. The math there is very similar to this right here. And so the, this thing right here, again, this is an, a creation. This is annihilation, right? So whenever you see daggers, uh, sometimes the notation is flipped. But when in, my, in the case that we're using in this book, uh, daggers mean creation. No daggers mean annihilation, okay? Because the dagger, I guess, looks like a plus sign. Okay, so by imposing the, um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is these guys right here, right? This is what we've established just before. These are sort of the same thing 
as saying the Heisenberg uncertainty principle just in more mathematical terms, we then come to this conclusion down here. Right? And this conclusion down here is uh, are, are the relationships we're looking for when it comes to creating and annihilating particles that have certain momentum. Okay? So, and that's going to, the, 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 these, so by imposing these guys, we get these, right? Um, so we get these guys are a direct consequence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle applying to complex conjugate fields. And there are many videos out there on YouTube that derive, the, derive these relationships. I can derive these relationships myself if that's something you might be interested in. I'll take a look at the comments later. However, this is what we get. This is the point, right? This is the point. Now, before we finish, I want to take a look at this picture here. So this picture here is something that I've sort of uh, been uh, leaning on for a while, this idea that, okay, you have a field, and at each point in the field, you have some sort of vector, some sort of number, some sort of tensor, what have you. These objects, again, uh, exist at every point in space and time, the operators themselves exist at every point in space and time. And what we have is um, a picture that looks like this. And at every point, we have an operator, and the operator is made up of these basis functions. Right? So the, these basis functions, the basis functions can be thought of as oscillating frequencies, and the weight on these oscillating fre frequencies are these creation and annihilation operators, right? So in one case, we have a creation field, or, or an annihilation field, and a creation field. Each one of these is made up of a basis state of oscillating functions, and these oscillating functions, right, are the, os are the functions that are associated with particles of certain momentum. Right. Uh, certain momentum k. And that's really what I want to talk about in this video. This is complex scalar fields in a nutshell, and I think this is really the take-home point that we want to understand for these types of fields. Next, we're going to get into Dirac fields. We're going to spend quite a few videos uncovering what Dirac fields are like. These Dirac fields are going to be um, new, right? Because we're not going to be talking about scalar fields anymore. We're retiring from scalar fields in the next video, and we are going to look at spinners, right? Spinners are these really weird, abstract mathematical objects. What I'm going to try to do is explain it in a way that, so that um, it can be relatively easy, hopefully relatively easy to understand. Uh, spinners are no trivial matter. They're very weird abstract mathematical objects, but what we're going to get from those guys uh, and quantizing those fields is the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay. And we also want to re remember that we are not only going for our solutions, we're not only going to be summing over, um, we're not going to be summing over just momentum, but we're going to be summing over spin states, up or down, right? And this is going to be the next topic of our, uh, of the next few videos, which is the spinner fields, spinner, quantized spinner fields, right? So with that being said, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.